One of the topics the elders wanted us to talk about before we got into the next series was the topic of children. As we've just finished VBS, we felt like this was a good opportunity for us to do that. Goodness gracious, we are thankful for all of you that played a role in the best VBS that we've had in my time here, certainly in the past decade. It was wonderful, and there was so much effort, uh, so many of you to thank. Uh, it'd be hard to even begin. We, you know who you are. We're thankful for you if you played any role at all, uh, from setting up or from planning the whole thing or just being here and loving the children. We are incredibly thankful for this church. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at this idea of the Lord's heart for children, you got your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. Uh, these verses actually won't be on the screen, uh, but if you want to just listen, you can listen. But I'd like for you to see how these verses are all right here together, where Christ turns his attention for this section on children in particular. Matthew 18, starting in verse 1, we'll jump a little bit. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Look at verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Listen to this line. This is incredible to think about. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who's in heaven. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who's in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. One more, look at chapter 19, verse 13. It says, Then children were brought to him, that he may lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Now here's the question I want us to think about as we begin. Why do children do to our hearts what they do? I've never been a crier, never been particularly emotional. In fact, I've found that to be one of my greatest weaknesses. One of my prayers throughout my life has been for God to help me be more emotional, help me to cry more, help me to feel more. It's always been a, a weakness, and it still is really. It's still one of my common prayers for God to help me to be more emotional and even to, to cry and to weep. Uh, and that seems to be, that, to be the case in every category of my life except for one. And that is, of course, the category of my children. Maybe that was God's answer to my prayer was giving me five children. There is no doubt that the place in my life where I cry by far the most often is in direct relation to my, to my children. Certainly the place that I feel the most overwhelming emotion is because of and in regard to my children. Sometimes it's because I'm hurting for them. Sometimes it's because I am hurt by them. Sometimes it's because I'm happy for them and proud for them. Most often, if I'm honest, it's because I hear a song and it makes me think about how much I value them and how quickly these days that I enjoy so much are passing away. There's several songs that get me, of course. You probably can think of a few songs in your life that talk about children growing up that make you emotional. Trace Adkins to be, should be thrown in prison for singing both uh, Then They Do and uh, You're Going to Miss This, right? Those get me every time, of course. Uh, there's one by a, a Christian writer named Andrew Peterson, um, called um, Be Kind to Yourself, where he's begging his children to, to do that, to be kind to themselves, to love them the way, themselves the way that God loves them. That gets me. There's one about um, having sons that you didn't get to have when they were babies. That, for obvious reasons, uh, gets me. But there's one recent one, kind of new one, that is batting 100% and making me cry. I think it's four for four. And you may not have heard it. It's by a, a guy named Walker Hayes. And the, the title of the song is uh, If Father Time Had a Daughter. I'm going to read just a few lyrics for you from that song because you probably haven't heard it. It starts like this. Saturday, sleep late, bed, head, smile, daddy, daughter, date down the cereal aisle, shopping cart ride with my Goldilocks, little arms wrapped around a Lucky Charms box. Right there, that's my world. Father time must have never had a little girl. I know I'm going to blink and I'm going to be a mess 
when that Cinderella shirt is a wedding dress and they'll play that song so bittersweet and I'll remember her in her little bare feet. <clears throat> Dancing on her toes on my boots. I'll try not to cry, but you're going to have to give me a break if you see a few tears. These are just some really, really, really good years. I bet daddy's girls would stay little a little bit longer if Father Time had a daughter. Yeah, good grief. That's right. Now, here's, here's the, the sort of profound, deep, philosophical, theological question that I really want us to think about is why does that do that to me? Right? Why, why does that and other songs like it have that effect on your heart in a way that very few things, if any, do? The answer is because you were made in the image of a God who feels the same way about children. Because you were made in the image of a God and a Christ who speaks about children like this and, and who it says, goodness, we could spend a lot of time on the verse where he says, their angels look on the face of God. It does that to my heart because I was made in the image of a God that feels the same way about children. Let me spin the illustration around to the negative side. I don't know if you've seen the movie The Sound of Freedom yet. If you haven't, you should. It is a, sound, it is a movie about uh, slavery and trafficking, especially sex trafficking and, trafficking and primarily trafficking of, trafficking of children. And that movie affected me more than any movie that I remember. And there were scenes in the beginning or that you have real life video camera shots of children being taken. And I remember physically sinking down in my chair, trying to get away from the screen because of what it was doing to me. And, and the question is the same, why does that happen? Why does things with children, both profoundly positively and profoundly painfully, affect us in that way? So uniquely, and the answer is because you were made in the image of a God that feels the same way about children. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Their angels always see the face of my Father in heaven. And about leaving the 99 for the one, it says, it's not the will of my Father in heaven that any one of these little ones should perish. Let the little children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Now, God has, as you have seen and heard, blessed us with many children in this church. And so, by lieu of that blessing, also has called us to a high calling of raising these children, discipling them in the Lord, helping the parents to do that, helping the parents, walking alongside all of these many young parents as we labor to raise these children to know the Lord and to make sure that they know that they are loved. And goodness gracious, this church has loved my children and so many children so well. From Amber and the Sunshine video you've seen, all the effort she puts in, and Miss Cheryl back in the nursery, and all those who take place in the nursery, and Peyton and Tristan taking over our children's ministry and doing a lot of exciting things. I remember... I still see it in my mind, but when I was growing up, in those young teen years especially, there were a few people at church, two or three grown adults, that I looked forward to seeing every week because I knew they were just going to be happy to see me. That made me feel loved. The prof profound impact you're having on these children's lives just by making them feel loved, just by you being a grown-up that's excited to see them is hard to quantify. And we are thankful for this church and all that you are doing. We want to do everything we can as a church to help you walk alongside you, raise your children in the joy of knowing Christ. You already know about a lot of things we're doing, about the Ohachi Kids, our new ministry, which stands for Kids in Discipleship. And uh, there's a summer uh, calendar you can get today. There's also t-shirts that are here today. You can grab those they're, they're in. But additionally, we're moving into another area of ministry that I want, I want you to know about and I want you to consider. And it is this one with the Etowah and Calhoun County foster care system. The reason for this is because this system is in a time of crisis. It shouldn't be surprising for us because in our current world, it is uh, the reality that when sexual immorality and license meets a lack of real men and real women, a lack of responsibility, the ones who are most harmed most often are children. And so the foster care systems in our counties in particular, Geds and in Calhoun County, have many more kids in need of somewhere to go than they have places to send them. In fact, other counties and cities around the state are having to come to the aid of the county that we are in, that we all live in, to provide homes for the kids um, that are simply not there here. Christians have 
certainly since America began, but even further back than that, have, have generally been uh, small government minded. And that's because Christians have generally been big church minded, that the church is to take on a lot of the responsibilities that we have now laid over to the government. And so we have become very often lackadaisical when it comes to much of these things, because we think, well, the government will just take care of those things. When Christians in the past have realized that many of those things, including orphans, are primarily the responsibility of Christians in the church, that we should be looking for ways to serve them in a way that only God does. A very good friend of mine who's here today, Ked Wolf, this week, who I haven't seen in years, came to VBS, and, and he brought up to me, while I was studying this, weren't talking about this at all, he brought up to me the foster care crisis in our counties and that there is such a problem that needs to be dealt with. God just giving me a little elbow that I think we're on the right path of talking about that this week. We as God's people with all he has called us to, must get involved in some way. Of course, if you're a member here, you know this, but a few of our young people here are directly connected to this process. You may know that my oldest two, Alanis and Jerry, were on their way to the state uh, where, they, where we were told they were going to be split up in order to try to find them a place to be placed, a home to be placed in, uh, which is when the Lord put Ariel and I into the picture. Most of you know about Megan and Mila. Uh, Mila... Megan's daughter came to her through the foster care system. Her mother, Mila's mother, gave birth to her in prison and then was given to other family members who were uh, controlled by drugs. And so her first 11 months of life were brutal and she was malnourished, born addicted to these drugs until she was given to Megan and Megan took care of her. Uh, the caseworker told Megan that this same mother had had seven children before Mila and in the caseworker's words... Mila was the only one that was given a real chance at life. When we lived in Atlanta, the church we went to at the time would take a Sunday each year and would focus on foster care and adoption. And I've got a video here. Um, make sure that's, the volume is working on that. I've got a video here of, of my mom talking about a little bit of one of those um, Sundays and the time when they were felt, uh, when they felt called to this thing. Uh, they started showing children the photos of these children in front of the church and they just flashed up over and over and over all these children and I remember just thinking it's so wonderful because they all were placed in homes and at the end of the presentation they said these are the children that had no homes to go to because we didn't have enough foster parents and at that moment we just looked at each other and decided this is something we need to do this is something we God wants us to do and we signed up that day they called and um, they said, we have three little boys. Would you take them? And we said, yes. And, uh, and they were just precious. It took them a while to trust us because they'd been hurt so badly. So the, we wanted them to know that they were welcomed in the home. And so what we did was the first night we invited all our church friends and we had a big dinner and just to let the boys know and meet some friends from church because everybody brought their children. We learned a lot that night because um, they all ate. I fixed their place. They had plenty. We put them to bed that night and in the middle of the night, it sounded like, um, I don't know, something was blowing up. And so Larry had woke up, the oldest. He woke up after we all went to sleep and went down to the kitchen and found the rest of that strawberry shortcake and ate it all because he never knew when he was going to get another meal. We were comforting Larry and cleaning everything up and telling him it was going to be okay. He just needed to know he wasn't going to go hungry. But it was eye-opening as to what these boys had been through. Mm -hmm. You okay? I am. It's just, it's just, uh, It's tough to remember, because even after it's been this long, you still miss them being a part of your life and a part of our world. And they still are, you know, but um, that's tough because you, know, you just wish the best for them always, and, and they're just so special, and they're so little. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? 
Only a holy God. We as Christians have been very given very clear biblical instructions about how we are to treat children. We're given the examples of Jesus and the way he treats children. And we are called to love those the same way that Christ has loved us. Many of us in here have experienced these type of people, these type of children who have been so desperately in need of love, in need of care, and it does indeed rightly and truly affect our hearts in the way that it should affect your heart. Because we are called to such a high thing when it comes to these sort of children. James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Psalm 68, 5 and 6, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. Psalm 146, 9, the Lord protects the stranger. He supports the fatherless. Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan. Matthew 25, 40, the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Psalm 82, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, rescue the weak and needy. Christians have always been the people in societies that they've been in that have taken care of children. In the first century, in Rome at the time, there was a practice called exposure that was considered normal, where if people didn't want their child, didn't want their infant, they could take it outside the city gates and they would just leave it there. And the infant would be killed either by the weather or by the wild animals that would come for it. Later, Christians are the ones who invented orphanages and invented the idea of caring for children who had nowhere to go. Still to this day, Christians are the ones who lead the charge against uh, abortion, fighting for the most innocent of children. As we are the ones called to do that, Christians have been the ones who have done that since the very beginning. And the point of this, of course, is that the entire paradigm of Christianity is that we have been treated by Christ as if we were his, even though we were indeed spiritual orphans. That's the language we get throughout the Bible. Romans 8, 15, you have not received the spirit of slavery, falling back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom you now are able to call God Abba, Father. That you now are able to call God the same thing that Jesus calls God, Abba. Ephesians chapter one, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will. One of the main ways the Bible talks about us as Christians is that we've been adopted. One of the main ways the Bible talks about our salvation is that God has brought us into his home and welcomed us around his new family table. If you got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. That word redeem being, being an explicitly financial word, that he has bought us, that he has redeemed us. And because you are sons, verse 6, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. It's hard, it's hard to quantify <clears throat> the impact that, that, that those years of having those boys, and we had a little girl too, actually, a lot of that time, had on me and Caleb. In a way so that when, when the Lord laid Alanis and Jerry on Errol and I, it wasn't a shocking thing. This is what, this is what Christians do. We care for the children that need to be cared for. We invite them around our tables and, and we love them in the way that Christ has loved us. There is cost to fostering and of course to adopting. Not as much financial cost to foster care. There's virtually none, but there are costs always of your time and of stress and of your pleasures. But there are a few things more deep and true and right 
than accepting the cost for the sake of another, especially for the sake of a child. One minister wrote of witnessing several families in his church adopt. And of this, he said, it means, this means that these people are looking to their heavenly father for their joy rather than rejecting the stress and cost of children in order to maximize their freedoms and comforts. When people embrace the pain and joy of children at the expense of their personal freedoms, the worth of Christ shines more visibly. Three practical things, and we're done. Three final statements. Let me get to them. There's the first one. First, get your child involved here. There is an abundance of wealth in these walls with these people and desire to disciple your child. Whether you have children or not, be one of the adults that makes them feel loved and helps them know what it's like to follow Jesus. Be involved with the children. Secondly, consider opening your home for foster needs. Have a conversation at home about the possibility of these things. Currently in our state, there are 6,000 children in foster care. That may seem daunting until you realize that there are 500,000 families that attend church every Sunday in Alabama. Some only need foster care for a few days. Some obviously need it for much longer. If you don't want to do that, of course, there are plenty of ways to serve. Look for opportunities to serve the families that are doing so, to invest in the lives of these children who have been abandoned. Pray desperately. The reality is that God intends for all of us to be involved with the lowly and with the orphan. Pray for them. Pray for the families. Give financially to help them. Pray for ways to be involved. If you have any interest in these things at all, uh, Megan Brooks, the one I showed a minute ago, Mila's mom, is, gonna, is, is heading up this connection with the foster care systems for us. She's going to come down front after service is over. Please come talk to her, and, and, and we will help you however we possibly can. It's daunting when we think about the kids around the world that need to be cared for, and, and it, it often feels like we can't really make a difference, and I understand that feeling. But we can shine brightly in the place that God has placed us. We can love very radically in the, in the counties that our church is in and that we live in. Finally, know that the special place that you have in your heart for children is the way our Lord feels about you. That, goodness, we could spend weeks on that reality. The, the joy and love and overwhelming emotion and never d- turning my back on my child kind of love, no matter what the child does to me, I will be there for them kind of love is the way that God feels about you. Yes, you, even you, even me. That that's how God feels about you, that he, is not, that he is not just tolerating you, hoping someday you'll stop sinning. He knows for a fact that you won't and he has chosen you anyway. He knows for a fact that you're going to continue failing and he has decided to love you anyway. And there will never be a moment we will utterly turn his back on you. You are the child that he loves. And the joy that I feel for my children, as hard as it is to comprehend, is dwarfed by the love that God has for me. If we can help you be welcomed into that love and to this family, we want to do that. If, if you've been frustrated by the church in the past, welcome home. That's what families are. When, you, when you're adopted into a new family, you find yourself around a table with new siblings, and a lot of times they're difficult. And the same thing is true here. You have found yourself, dear Christian, around a table with new brothers and sisters, with new siblings. Some of them you'll get along with, some of you, them you won't, but all of them you have been called to love. Welcome home. If there were no difficult people before you came in, there are now, now that you're here. And it's a joy to be able to love you and be loved by you. We can help you at all. If we can pray for you, please come now while we stand and while we sing.